Uh, I work for Innovation Norway in France uh, with assisting Norwegian companies in the French offshore wind market. Uh, and I also coordinate Innovation Norway's High Potential Opportunities Program for uh, offshore wind in uh, Europe. Uh, High Potential Opportunities, or HPO, is a program for large national export priorities. Uh, for Norway, offshore wind uh, is, of course, one of the primary export priorities. Uh, and through the HBO program, uh, we work in a targeted manner to help Norwegian companies succeed uh, in international markets and to foster international business partnerships in offshore wind. So in this session, we will discuss, discuss business and cooperation on offshore wind across all of Europe's sea basins, uh, both bottom fixed and floating uh, technologies. We will cover uh, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, uh, the North Adriatic, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. Uh, I work with offshore wind in France, uh, so I'm here to learn as much as you uh, in the audience, and I'm really uh, looking forward to hear from today's presenters. We will hear uh, from speakers from Norway, Poland, Portugal, Croatia, Romania, Estonia, and Greece. First, we will get 15-minute presentations uh, from all of the speakers, introducing offshore wind in their countries, policies, and opportunities for business collaboration. We will then proceed to a panel discussion where we will explore topics such as how to build international uh, business collaboration in offshore wind, how to build supply chains and transfer competencies from oil and gas, how to balance the need for local content with the need for international collaboration, and the need to accelerate the offshore wind development and move forwards with increasing speed and scale. So I hope we'll have the time for all of that. And speaking of uh, speed and scale, uh, I have some breaking uh, news from Norway this morning. Uh, the Norwegian government announced uh, a new target to install 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2040. So that's uh, a happy backdrop to our conversation. Uh, Europe, as you know, has great ambitions for offshore wind. Installed offshore wind capacity in Europe uh, is expected to increase from around 25 gigawatt today to about 450 by uh, 2050. This means we have a big job to do, and today's session will aim to uh, provide some answer as to how to get this done. Uh, we are all, of course, faced with the same global challenge, which is to combat climate change. The EU has set targets to cut 55% of greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2030 and bring their renewable energy share to 32% uh, in the same period. And uh, there is no national environmental industry plan or program that can do this alone. So in Innovation Norway, uh, we all share a conviction that uh, this challenge can only be solved through uh, bold policy moves, innovation and technology development, industrial development, and importantly, international cooperation. We share common challenges and should also aim to find joint solutions. So therefore, it goes without saying that international business collaboration will be cru crucial to this development. And we have some excellent speakers with us today that will present their countries uh, offshore wind industries and potential for international business collaboration. So let us, without further ado, hear from the speakers. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker uh, of the day. Turarne Jonsen is EU advisor in Norwegian Offshore Wind, an industry cluster working to support the offshore wind industry in Norway. The cluster has uh, three main focus areas or uh, must win battles, building a home market, supporting innovation, and promoting export development. But Tor Arne will tell you more about offshore wind in Norway. The floor is yours. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, inviting Norwegian Offshore Wind to this uh, conference. Um, we are a, a cluster in Norway. Um, we have changed name. We were Norwegian Offshore Wind Cluster, and now we're just Norwegian Offshore Wind. Uh, so we have changed name. Uh, it's because of cluster. It's not so very positive in English. So 
We are Norwegian Offshore Wind, and we have 360 companies in Norway that are focusing on offshore wind. Most of these companies come from the oil and gas sector, and they have technology, they have solutions that they also can use uh, into the offshore wind sector. I will talk a lot about offshore wind. I will also talk a little bit about football, because I think it's kind of parallel here. So, uh, next slide. Uh, this is not the FIFA ranking, but it could be the FIFA ranking. Who is the best in the world? Uh, these um, countries you see here, this is, a, this is a ranking done by the Global Win Association about which countries in the world have the largest potential in floating offshore wind. And you see Norway is uh, quite high up. We are not so high up on the FIFA ranking, but on the floating offshore wind, we are quite high. But we, you could also see there are other countries, uh, Portugal, Greece, um, Bulgaria, Romania, um, Croatia, that is also high on this agenda. And just to say a little bit, I, I won't use too much time on this. The first on the left, the, the blue, its potential on floating offshore wind. Uh, the other two, uh, lighter blues, is kind of the competition from solar or from uh, bottom fixed. And then you have the land constraint. If there are very high land constraint, then it's more to invest offshore. Uh, and also about hydrogen and targets on renewable uh, policies. Now with the 30 gigawatt coming from the Norwegian government, I believe we will also be maybe on 21 points now, just not just 20, I hope. Our cluster, uh, 360 member companies. Uh, we have had analyses done that uh, Norwegian companies in floating offshore wind could take a 20% market share globally. And we, if you are talking about turbines, by 2050, maybe there will be installed 160,000 turbines. That's a lot, so maybe Norwegian companies, when we are talking about turbines, could provide maybe up to 20% of that. Today, in Europe, it's about 5,000 turbines installed. So it's going to be a lot of turbines that is going to be installed from now on until 2050. But if we're going to take this position with 20% market share, we need to have the first mover advantage. As you all know, we are not very fast in Norway. We try, but first mover, you need to be the first mover. You need to have a home market if you want to succeed in the Champions League football. Then you need to have a strong first division. And that is important. And you also need to have the right support mechanism. So all that needs to be in place that Norway is going to take this uh, position. These are the companies. 360, no, I think it's maybe 364. We have a lot of companies coming from the oil and gas sector that want to target the offshore wind business. Uh, what about these companies? Uh, very few are very large. About 60% of the companies are service providers. 50% of the companies are less than 20 employees. So they are very small companies. And what do they need? <laughs> they need partnerships. If they want to succeed on export, if they want to succeed in the Norwegian market, they need to couple up with other, other businesses to provide services because they are too small. Um, and we also have ports. We see ports as a crucial aspect, in, especially on the floating offshore wind in this, developing this supply chain. Uh, these are some of the advantages that uh, we think Norway have. We have 50 years with floating oil and gas platforms. These are mooring systems, marine operation. 
that is something that we have done in harsh conditions for 50 years. So we have a lot of competence on that area, and that could almost be copied over to the floating offshore wind business. We also are taking the green transition very seriously. So we have companies like Edda Wind here that have, uh, they are building ships. They are having ships in service now that are hybrid ships. That means that they can go both on you know, traditional fuel, but also on green fuel. So we see this is a very important advantage. The last one, advantages, is come from, in a way, how floating offshore wind is designed. The differences between bottom fixed and floating wind is that the whole fabrication assembly is done at the port, and then you tow out the whole turbine, and you put it in the sea. Um, these have some constraints, weather constraints, for example. So there are just some areas during the year that you can do this. And what do we have in Norway? We have two things. We have a lot of land, and we have the fjords. The fjords here could be a storing facilities for hundreds of turbines. And what you see, uh, the picture on the bottom here, it's a large area where they want to fabricate, the, and they want to assemble, and they want to store the turbines until the good weather comes. We don't have a lot of good weather in Norway, but we have some. So when the good weather is there, then they tow it out. So this is kind of the industrialization of the floating wind business, and we think the Norwegian companies have some advantages in this area. One uh, extra point here is that we see a consolidation in the businesses in Norway. We see that smaller companies go together or get uh, acquired by larger company to create this capacity. If you want to, for example, uh, assembly 70 turbines, almost as big as the Eiffel Tower, each of them, you need to have a lot of capacities. So you need to have a large area. So even Arca Solutions team up with large companies to have the capacity to deliver. So we think capacity to deliver is very important. And if you want to succeed on that, you need to have partnerships around the world. Um, the total addressable market with the um, ports and the tow out costs of the tow out is very cheap. 10 days, we see, is the tipping point. That means that for the Norwegian port, it's not only the Norwegian continental shelf that is the market. We could even assemble tow out or turbines down to northern Spain. And we will still be in competition. We, the cost would not be especially higher. So that means that we could, in a way, take uh, large opportunities in the northern European market. And this is kind of the epicenter right now. Um, Gyrid mentioned our three uh, most important things to develop this supply chain, the home market. We need to have a home market. We need to have the fir strong first division. We need to have competition in that market. Innovation, we need to innovate. The cost of electricity to produce uh, no, on floating is too high. It needs to come down. There are two main issues there. One is innovation, to do things cheaper. The other is industrialization. You need to do this in large scale. And we see also export. Export is important, not export of electricity but export of competence and export of technology and solutions. Wind farm development takes time. This is from Wind Europe's um, presentation. So we spend a lot of time developing, and as you see, the installation starts very late here. You need to have the financial close. You need to have the support scheme in hand. You need to do a lot of analysis. And there is opportunities for you 
it's opportunities for companies doing analysis, feasibility studies in this period. If you do it right, you can also get the contracts when you come to installation. So start early with providing services, providing uh, technology. Then you can position yourself uh, when the big bucks come, and that's about here and in the installation phase. And then you also probably need to team up with other companies. Uh, this is Norway, uh, two area. We have, uh, this is kind of the first division in Norway. Uh, we have two different, one is floating, uh, and the other is, uh, is bottom fixed. Uh, we want to develop both. What is happening now with the 30 gigawatt that the Norwegian government is going to develop, I don't know, but they have plans for the other areas that they want to develop. So this is, and uh, the main point here is competition. We don't need these areas to be acquired by one company or one partnership. We need different partnership because we need to test the best partnerships and we need to develop the best uh, uh, supply chains. <coughs> these are the companies that is um, targeting the Norwegian market. This is, this is really the Champions League in offshore wind. These, these, these are the main actors. There are some that is not on here, but uh, these, are the, these are the main actors. Um, and the companies that are kind of the wind farm developers are the ones in red. And the other is the local content, so to speak. So they team up with local companies to develop this. Um, and, and we think this is going to be very interesting. Which of these um, partnerships that is going to win. We hope a lot of the partnership is going to win because we need competition. I will just uh, mention uh, one here, um, and that's uh, EDF. Uh, and uh, let's see if I can find other, and Iberdrola. I will come back to that, but see those two. See those two. EDF and Iberdrola. This is Horizon Europe. This is large project funding funded by the European Commission. 25 million euros going to one project, building an 11 megawatt turbine, floating turbine in concrete, uh, fabricated and assembled in Norway, tested in Norway, and the technology now, they are building this, so they are going to install it in 2023. And the technology here is very interesting. Because the project leader here is Iberdrola. Another partner is EDF. So what they do here with the EU funding is that they test a concept that they maybe can use in the commercial aspect that is coming. And they're testing this now. Another thing is that this EU project goes for three to four years. About the demonstration of, of the turbines is about one year. But what do the companies do here? Of course, they are training. This is kind of, when we're talking about football, this is a five-a-side. They are training here together and see Iberdrola together with Core Marine or other companies that see, are they delivering? If they are delivering in this project, they could also deliver on the commercial aspects. So EU projects is a very good way to, in a way, test technology, but maybe more important to test partnerships, because the partnerships is very important here. I believe I'm running out of time. Um, I'm going to be fast. Speed is important. Um, two markets. Uh, that uh, we focus in the cluster. We have working group on different export markets. Uh, one of these are uh, Greece. The picture here are the one on the left is the depth, water depth. The other is the, is the wind speed. And this Aegean area in Greece is uh, kind of functioning as a tunnel. So you have very high wind speed. So this area here is very attractive for developing offshore wind. 
um, and we think that uh, and now in offshore wind especially on floating it's a lot about speed who is first right first mover advantage Greece is there Portugal is there Norway UK uh, France it's a lot of country now that is going to develop this and I think maybe there is going to be some challenges on the capacity side. Do we have enough steel? Do we have enough workers? Do we have enough yeah, ships, vessels to develop or to install all this that is going to be installed in the future? We have cooperation here and we th see Greece as a very important market when it comes to the EEA funding we think it's a very good stepping stone to either going into eu projects or going into commercial projects yes uh, last one is portugal it's another very interesting market for us so we are really looking for greece and portugal as two of the export market both of them are floating both of them uh, have synergies with the norwegian supply chain thank you for your attention Thank you, Turane. Uh, very interesting uh, to hear about offshore wind from Norway, and uh, especially interesting to hear about how you can use EU projects to test both technologies and to test partnerships. But we will hear more about that in the panel discussions later. Uh, for now, uh, let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Jakub Budzinski, who is the vice president of the Polish Offshore Wind Energy Society. Uh, you will offer us a growth perspective on the Polish offshore wind market and also tell us a bit about the business opportunities in Polish offshore wind. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, my name is Jakub Budzyński. I represent Polish Offshore Wind Energy Society, which stands for uh, the longest uh, existing uh, functioning uh, offshore wind industry cluster uh, in uh, Central uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, Polish Ocean Wind Energy Society is consisting of 140 companies, uh, uh, cross-sectoral, I would say, in terms of supply chain for ocean wind, starting from the turbine suppliers, like Siemens Gamesa, G Power, and so on. Uh, finishing with, like my colleague Tor mentioned, uh, with very small local companies, uh, really open for the partnerships, looking for opportunities in cooperation, uh, Europe-wise uh, and maybe global-wise uh, for the development of the offshore wind market. And now I will tell you, I will present you what uh, Polish uh, offshore wind market means for the potential uh, business actors entering Polish market. What is the opportunity, what is the scale of the market development, in fact? Uh, that's why I presented, I prepared this first slide based on Wind Europe's annual report for the 2021 uh, with a forecast for the offshore wind market development in Europe by 2030. Uh, and I must say this chart uh, pours much joy to the Pol Polish hearts, uh, very much connected with offshore wind, uh, because for the first time in history this chart presents Poland as a future uh, development uh, area of the offshore wind technology. Starting from 2025, you can see on the chart, uh, do we have a pointer here? No, I don't think so. Uh, anyway, you can see starting from 2025, uh, maybe not rapidly, but uh, systematically growing capacity installed in the Polish market. In the later slides, I will show you how it is uh, expressed. It is analyzed in three scenarios based optimistic and pessimistic as well. But anyway, uh, Poland uh, uh, is to install f at least few gigawatts by 2030. We'll see how much. Uh, in special terms, what uh, the Polish offshore wind market looks like. Uh, all the gray areas you can see on the drawing, uh, this is Maritime Special Plan drawing, official document adopted in Poland in May 2021 by the Council of the Ministers, so it is binding document in terms of spatial arrangements uh, for all the uh, maritime sea, sea users, not only for offshore wind, but the gray areas are dedicated exclusively to offshore wind. You can see the brief description here that uh, the Polish uh, exclusive economical zone of the Baltic Sea, 
um, uh, seas over uh, 2300 uh, square kilometers dedicated only for offshore wind, uh, which stands for about 10% of Polish EEZ of, uh, of the Baltic Sea. Um, uh, the areas uh, uh, partially are already uh, used by developers uh, with the existing already well established uh, established in the development phase projects. Some of the areas are still uh, for the future developments. Uh, next slides will also present uh, this situation uh, in more uh, details. Anyhow, uh, with the slides, I would like I wanted to show you that. Uh, the Polish offshore market uh, is already, let's say, regulated. It's not only the forecast, it's not only, uh, let's say, uh, outlook, uh, future possible situation. It is, um, uh, it is regulated in form of acts, official documents binding for Polish government, Polish administration, and showing the direction for the industry and the business development in dot terms. Uh, this slide. Uh, presents um, uh, the spatial, uh, spatial configuration uh, of the already existing offshore wind projects. Uh, as you can see on the slide, we have, especially with the, the brown uh, color, we have marked uh, we have marked the most developed projects, starting from the uh, from the west to the east. Uh, we have uh, nine projects being in the very serious, very advanced uh, uh, phase of the development at the moment. All the projects presented on the slide uh, will enter uh, the construction phase, construction phase in 2024 uh, in terms of preparation of the site, uh, piling uh, and so on. Effectively, the projects will be, uh, are to be delivered at latest by 2030. Uh, ob obviously, uh, we see many constraints now like uh, broken supply chains, like uh, very expensive raw materials, like uh, uh, lacks, uh, lacking uh, competences, services in the market. The demand is uh, many times higher than the uh, than the uh, supply uh, supplies. But uh, anyhow, uh, having uh, very experienced investors already in Poland, like Ørsted, like Equinor, like Norton Power, we believe that it will help us. Uh, to, uh, to make the process very smooth and be delivered uh, on time. Uh, these projects are amounting uh, totally to about uh, nine or eight and a half gigawatts in uh, already issued GCAs, so grid connection agreements. So these documents are really binding for the investors and the transmission system operator uh, in Poland as well. We have only one uh, transmission system operator, 100% state-owned company Polskie Sieci Elektroenergetyczne SA. Uh, the documents, the GCAs, uh, uh, expresses or, or describes uh, the conditions for, for the both parties of the agreement uh, that should be delivered prior to the uh, connection, uh, the wind farms to the grid. In that terms, the situation in Poland, um, in terms of development of the wind farm, is slightly different than on the other markets, because in Poland, the developer is obliged to deliver uh, the grid infrastructure, offshore and onshore as well. It makes the project slightly ex more expensive, uh, uh, but uh, the uh, level of determination, I would say, uh, on the both sides, investors and uh, transmission system operators, is so high, uh, that uh, I have no doubts that the projects will be delivered, even though if they are a uh, little bit more expensive than usually, uh, anyhow, after uh, the project is constructed and uh, connected to the grid fully, uh, the um, operator will rebuy the infrastructure, grid infrastructure from the investor. So this will be no longer a cost uh, for the investor in terms of maintenance of the grid. Uh, and uh, this table uh, shows uh, how uh, the projects look like uh, in terms of development. As you can see in the table, as I mentioned before, we have very experienced developers already on board on Polish market. We have Polenergia and Equinor, especially Equinor, the Norwegian company, uh, which is in 50-50 joint venture with Polish uh, entity Polenergia, private company. Uh, the joint venture is responsible for development of three projects, Baltic 1, Baltic 2, and Baltic 3. Especially Baltic 2 and 3 are most developed projects. Baltic 1 will be delivered slightly later, but Baltic 3 and Baltic 2 
are amounting now uh, to a total uh, capacity of 1,400 uh, megawatts. Uh, the Polish champions, Polish uh, state-owned companies, PG Baltica and Pekai Norland are already in joint ventures with uh, market global absolutely leaders, uh, so Ersted and, and uh, Northland Power. Uh, PG Baltica with Ersted, they only will deliver uh, two and a half gigawatts by 2030. Uh, this is uh, actually one project, Baltica 3 and Baltica 2, connected in one site, uh, in one joint project, two and a half gigawatts. Uh, it's a huge project. The only uh, one bigger project we have globally now in, in, uh, in the offshore market is uh, Dogger Bank ABC, uh, three and a half gigawatts in UK. Uh, so this shows the real scale of, of the market development in Poland. And the can all land with, uh, with Northern Power is to deliver 1,200 megawatts by 2027, I would say. Uh, both projects, Baltica 3.2 and Baltic Power, are to be delivered by 2027 according to their official schedules. RWE, uh, another uh, global leader, which I'm also representing and cooperating with, uh, is to deliver uh, quite small projects uh, for today's standards. 350 megawatts, FEW Baltic 2, also by 27 at latest, and maybe in 2026. Uh, BC wind projects uh, of uh, total uh, capacity of uh, 400 megawatts belonging to ocean winds are to be delivered uh, about 2027, 2028. Uh, so you can see the situation is really, um, let's say, well developed, established on the Polish market, and we are heading and uh, now the uh, really uh, crucial phase, I mean construction, at least for the first phase. Uh, but I will show you later uh, what will uh, meet the Polish market in terms of future developments. Uh, all right. So this slide uh, shows you what I mentioned, uh, how the Polish market uh, is to be developing in upcoming decades. Uh, as you can see on the slide, 10.9 gigawatts, so practically 11 gigawatts of capacity in offshore wind are absolutely guaranteed by the Polish government under the support scheme, official uh, state support scheme. Uh, the support scheme for the first phase of the projects amounting to total volume of almost six gigawatts, uh, the, uh, the support scheme, the, the support, the decisions uh, about support are already granted. Uh, to the developers. Uh, uh, these projects, this, uh, this volume is already undergoing the notification process to European Commission. Uh, the final decision of EU Commission uh, about the support scheme for the projects uh, is uh, expected later this year. Uh, but uh, basically, it is, it is already decided. It's only a question of conditions, uh, detailed conditions. The support scheme is granted to the projects for uh, 25 years ahead, uh, starting from, uh, from the moment of uh, COD, so commence of delivery. Uh, next projects uh, uh, that will be developed in the further phases of the market development will be undergoing the auction system. Uh, the auction system is planned uh, in two steps, at least two steps, in 2025 and 2027. Uh, both auctions for maximum capacity of 2.5 gigawatts, amounting to uh, together to 5 gigawatts. Uh, again, under the support scheme uh, of Polish state, Polish, uh, Polish government. Uh, and these projects uh, are to be uh, delivered after 2030. Uh, about 2035, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, CBIT permit applications, uh, the applications are already submitted because Poland already started the second phase, second round, so-called, of the uh, of the uh, applications uh, submissions to the rel relative uh, respective authorities. Uh, the process, the formal process, uh, administration process is ongoing now. We have also optional auction planned for 2028, but only in case uh, if uh, we will have uh, still capa remaining capacity of more than 500 megawatts from the previous auctions. Um, personally speaking, I don't see a possibility that this auction will take a place because, again, uh, the demand 
for the capacity under the support scheme from the developer side is really huge. And I think that this supply uh, of the capacity by Polish government is uh, way too less. Uh, speaking of this, uh, lastly, the Polish government uh, via the Ministry of Climate and Environment expressed their will uh, to extend the, uh, the pipeline for the offshore wind in Poland. Uh, decisions are to be made with, within uh, next two, three years because it requires um, a revision of the Maritime Special Plan document, which is really binding for Poland in terms of locating the new uh, areas uh, dedicated to offshore wind. Um, here I presented a few uh, most uh, crucial, vital information about the status quo of the market development. Uh, what happened in 2020, 2021, because this really was a, a breakthrough period, I would say, for the Polish offshore market. Uh, by 2020, we were only speaking about the future perspective, possibilities and so on. But starting from the 17th of December 2020, when the uh, Offshore Wind Act, so-called Offshore Wind Act, has been officially adopted by Polish Parliament, we talk about facts. Uh, because the Offshore Wind Act uh, includes the support scheme uh, for the offshore wind uh, sector in Poland. And this was really needed for the market development in Poland. And this, was, this is what we were really uh, waiting for, asking for the Polish government as an organization. Uh, for, we've been asking for this, uh, let's say, for about tw 10 years, starting since 2010. Uh, we finally have it. This is adopted. Uh, this is, it came into force. And this is a binding law in Poland. The contracts uh, will be uh, granted, uh, already, already granted in forms of CFDs, so contracts for difference. Very popular mechanism in offshore wind, generally in renewables, uh, for, for the support of the uh, large scale uh, generation sources. We also have a, a sector deal in Poland, signed in uh, September 2021. Uh, this is a solution based on the British example. Uh, this is non-binding, this is a non-legal framework, but uh, in terms of CSR, really binding. Uh, the sector deal, Polish offshore wind sector deal, this is a trilateral agreement between the administration, governmental administration, uh, the industry uh, and the science. Uh, the, uh, the deal uh, refers to ambitious goals uh, for local content development in Poland. I will not describe it here in details, what the goals are, what are the levels of ambitions, uh, but uh, this document is a kind of a symbol. There's a kind of uh, strong will, uh, how the, uh, the Polish market should be regulated in the uh, supply chain for the offshore wind. Uh, it couldn't be regulated in, uh, in any other form, because uh, Poland as a part of European Union is uh, obliged to respect the rule of free competence and so on. Uh, but uh, anyhow, this is a morally, let's say, binding document. I see that I'm running out of time. It's typical for me, so I'm very sorry. Uh, so uh, in very slight details, uh, some more information. Uh, the round two, as I mentioned, for Polish uh, offshore wind sector is really uh, uh, now open. Uh, the applications have been submitted. Uh, the Minister of Infrastructure, which, which is responsible for the uh, maritime economy in Poland, is, uh, is deciding now which applications will be granted with the CBIT permits. This will happen uh, half to uh, 2022. Um, uh, so we'll see what will happen, who will be the next players, big players in the Polish market. We expect uh, the oil and gas players to, to enter Polish market, like Total, like Shell, BP, so on. Uh, it's, it's a global situation. The, these new players are entering global markets, so nothing new here, but uh, they will also be really hard fighting for Polish market because it's still a quite nice piece of market for them. Uh, the new areas I mentioned before uh, in the MSP uh, are marked with the, uh, with the uh, uh, here uh, on the map. Uh, these are the three areas in the west and two on the uh, northern part of the EZ. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, these areas have a energy uh, potential, offshore energy potential up to, uh, up to uh, six gigawatts. Uh, so this is the object of the run two of the offshore in special terms. Uh, and these locations will be granted this year. 
as I mentioned. We have the also uh, presentation, uh, presented here three scenarios of the market development, the dynamics of the market development. In the base case, as you can see, we will deliver in Poland at least six gigawatts of the capacity by 2030. In the optimistic case, even almost nine gigawatts. In the pessimistic, the worst scenario, we will deliver over four gigawatts. So we can see how is the, what is the perspective of the development for the supply chain. Okay, uh, some uh, slides about uh, the uh, local content promotion system not to be uh, mentioned here necessary. Um, and uh, the, sorry for running out of time, I have much more information. I hope I will be able to present it all during the panel discussion, but you are kindly really invited to enter the Polish market because uh, we have already established supply chain in Poland, but in terms of capacity of the supply chain and in terms uh, of uh, the know-how with regards to HSEQ regulations uh, or standards uh, and so on, the Polish market is really lacking this knowledge. Uh, so anyhow, uh, foreign companies with the experience in offshore wind are really highly invited to enter Polish markets. Sorry for the running out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jakub, for telling us about offshore wind in Poland, and we will get the chance to talk more about local content and uh, many other things during the discussion. Uh, so now I will introduce the next speaker from Portugal. It's Jose uh, Pinheiro, who is uh, country manager for uh, Southern Europe in Ocean Winds Portugal. Uh, so he will offer us the perspective of, uh, perspective of an international offshore wind developer uh, on the offshore wind developments in Portugal, as well as opportunities for international business collaboration. So the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. I hope you had your caffeine shot by now. <laughs> um, so my name is Jose Pinheiro, as correctly introduced. <laughs> uh, I'm the country manager for Southern European Business Unit. Uh, at Ocean Winds, that means that basically uh, I, with the team that I that I cal collaborate in a daily basis, we try to develop the the, the southern part of of, of Europe, uh, uh, and that uh, entails Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Greece. Four countries that, uh, as as my colleague said uh, before, uh, they are pretty much in competition to to see who comes first uh, in the new and the new phase of the renewable energies of these countries. I'm um, going just to, eventually this is a bit redundant, but uh, I'm going just to present who we are very briefly, Ocean Winds. It's a, it's a joint venture between EDP Renewables, um, which I, is where, my, where I come from, so to speak, uh, uh, one of the largest renewable energy players of the world, uh, that joined Angie, probably the, the biggest private utility, energy utility uh, of the world. And uh, decided in, back in 2019 to join forces uh, through a, an investment vehicle called Ocean Winds and to, to both invest uh, promoting, constructing and operating offshore wind farms. So not only uh, bottom fix, but also floating. And that's actually what I'm going to be tending more in this presentation, um, uh, but just before just going through the 11.2 gigawatt capacity that we have, uh, gross capacity uh, uh, under development or already in construction or already in operation. As you can see, we are already uh, covering the main regions of the world, but many other countries are being developed. Um, and why offshore floating wind? Because of the obvious reasons that most of the coastal, and it's just some snapshots of some areas of, of the globe, indeed, uh, are much more uh, um, suitable for, for floating, not suitable at all for bottom peaks. And here is the a great, great potential uh, that we, and I, and I have to say that I don't like very much the word potential. Uh, we need to start talking about doing it um, and start having regulation that actually, actually allows us to all invest and promote uh, renewable green or blue energy. 
as you want to call it. Um, so back in the days um, when actually there was no joint venture still, back in 2010, 2009, 20, 2009, 2010, um, EDP uh, saw and had a, somehow the vision of floating offshore wind acquired a, an American company which now has a, a, a nice footprint in, in Europe as well, in France and Portugal, called Principal Power. Um, that company, uh, it's not very typical that utilities enter into technology as a technology player. We normally are technology users, but that was a good decision, as it seems. Um, three typical challenges pose when we are breaking through with a new technology. First of all, if, it's, if, it's, if it is indeed reliable, if it can survive to the harsh conditions in the sea in this case, um, if it's bankable, will it be bankable or, and finally, will it be uh, cost efficient, the most cost efficient as, as possible. And I believe we have done that through a 10 years to, to, to a decade of work when we started and we launched the, the prototype uh, off the coast of Portugal uh, back in 2011. It, that pro prototype with a, with a two megawatt wind turbine uh, ran for nearly five years successfully. Uh, performance wise, it actually proven that it, it could work in a larger scale. And by the time that we were, uh, by the first years of, of operation of this wind farm, we already started then working towards the Wind Float Atlantic project, a, a, a much bigger uh, uh, capacity unit-wise and a little, uh, a little bit further than down, down the, the, into the sea in much more deep waters. So first of all, challenge number one was we can tick from the box, we did it. Uh, then we moved on to Wind Float Atlantic which is now in operation, in operation since, since uh, the very first day of 2020. Um, the, the project is a three unit uh, wind turbine uh, project. It's uh, sitting at 20 kilometers off the coast in the north of Portugal. A, this is already a 100, uh, water, uh, 100 meters water depth. It means, uh, 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 it meant uh, alongside with, with uh, the other Norwegian project basically the breaking through and showing not only to us but to the, to the industry that we could do it, that there is a way to harness the wind in, in deep waters. Um, but with this project we wanted to convince ourselves and convince the industry that the technology would be bankable and it was. So this wasn't a project, this is a pre-commercial project which, was not, which wasn't uh, financed on the balance sheet. We got a, a project finance deal with EIB. We went through a very rough uh, and tough uh, due diligence with the bank and with the lenders, uh, which al allowed us to, to, to sign the, the, the agreement by, by October 2018. Um, construction went through, through uh, difficult times uh, as well uh, as weather-wise was, was, uh, was tough. Um, but uh, as I said before, from the, the 31st of December 2019, we put the, the, the first unit online and then in a staggered manner, the, the project went online. The, it is very interesting to see this slide. If it's a bit confusing, I, uh, there, is, there isn't 360 suppliers here, <laughs> but it's less complicated than that. But it's very interesting to see with such a small project of three units uh, uh, and there are not, uh, it's not only not only these contractors here in the slide. There are many more. Uh, we had a multi-contract approach. Uh, we could call it a, a pan-European <laughs> uh, project. We had companies from Denmark, uh, France, Portugal, Spain, um, Norway as well. DNV. Uh, we we had the, the Norwegian branch of DNV uh, on board. And um, yeah, I mean. Uh, English as well, so we we definitely could we could see that, that there was value on 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 this pre-commercial project also uh, dragging the supply chain onto us. And the beginning was not very easy because not not many suppliers were, were willing to to we see the, this more of a risk than an opportunity. 
but uh, fortunately the ones that we that we could attract to the attention and in a competitive manner were were also visionaries as, as we were so um, yeah I mean some slides just to show you the the sheer size of, of, of the of the actual platforms the next generation will be much bigger um, this is a, a assembly uh, of the of two of the floaters in Portugal in, in the in the Lijnave shipyard a, a in a dry dock assembly way it is true that we will face tremendous challenges in the future with regards also to facilities uh, the challenge is is is, uh, is is the volume and and the, the lack of infrastructures that we will all be competing with each other and also with bottom fixed um, the transportation of of, uh, of the floater that was built in in Spain uh, and this is also interesting to see that the three small projects like wind float Atlantic um, already launched this kind of collaboration uh, across different multi-regional uh, co collaboration Spain in this case in the north of, of Spain Galicia had also uh, an important uh, uh, input to the success uh, of the project not only with the shipyard but also with the with the installation harbor where we have done the installation of the wind turbines um, uh, back in 2019 and 2020 so I mean we we also use the Vienna de Castello port, of course. The, it's our our base, and we also use the Leixões port, which is the it's more more known by by being the port of Oporto. Uh, so, as you can see, in a regional way, we 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 had to 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 bring different players to to work together uh, for the final product. Um, we then. Then the, the good day arrived when we saw the three running. Uh, this was a very long process, a, a process that is not only a success and the hard work of the private sector. I've said this many times and I keep on saying that, um, that the administration of Portugal in coordination with the European Commission, because this was indeed highly funded by, by the European Commission at the time, um, were, were the, it was uh, paramount for, for, for the success, indeed, because, um, and this is a le lesson, and there are many lessons learned there that should be attracted and retained in Portugal specifically, thinking ahead when we now are talking about going for uh, very large auctions, uh, uh, auctions of capacity of one, two, or three, or four giga in the, in the near future. There's a lot of knowledge in, in the public administration in Portugal that I believe it's very important to to make the work and leverage upon that. So we, it's also very interesting to see this that no one really uh, gives the, the, the right attention to the operational phase, uh, but it's the, indeed one of the most rich in terms of the de development of supply chain too. Uh, these are projects that, that at least uh, live for 25 years. In this case, we were able to construct a a brand new facility, warehouse with, with workshops and offices for the for the O and M teams, for the operational teams, uh, based in Vienna de Castello, um, giving a little bit more uh, life to to the port, and bringing more business to it, and the and the effort that we do to to locally engage with the, with the supply chain too. So more and more, uh, this project is 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 part of the region by engaging with the municipalities, by being in a constant dialogue with the region, uh, with the port authorities, where we also do a lot of work together, not only uh, for the operations to, to be done uh, as planned, but also doing everything that has to do with safety, safety drills, rescue drills with, with the entire uh, uh, rescue uh, uh, institutions. We, we do a lot uh, of work now and we've done in the past with the fishing industry. Uh, this is key for us. Uh, it's important that we also see this as a, a, a one of the most um, cru critical points when we are developing and constructing wind farms. The size of this project is small. The next generation and the next 
projects will be much bigger. Um, we are going to occupy uh, a lot of areas, and by using this word, it, it all already brings a lot of fear from, from uh, uh, traditional industries, such as the fisheries, of course, uh, and we believe that we can coexist. We are not the enemy. Uh, on the opposite, we can build synergies with them and, and, uh, and make, them, uh, make the areas indeed available, as long as we work together in the design of the wind pumps. So, uh, uh, from the experience of the Wind Float Atlantic, we can see a lot of, of innovation and R&D on the back of an in innovative project, which is very interesting to see. So, we are now being the vehicle of much more innovative uh, uh, R&D projects, being with the universities or uh, other companies, private companies. Uh, and we also see a very good opportunity in Portugal, which can be... Uh, uh, definitely transposed to, to other regions where offshore wind is still in its infancy, which is the, the, the need of, of training uh, people so that they are comfortable at sea. So m there are many schools and, and professional schools, universities that form people that are capable to work in the industry, but there is, there is a need as well to bring the offshore, scene, the offshore environment into it. Uh, and, and there is there is some conversations within the municipality of, of Vienna do Castelo, as I said before, um, trying to bring that that into into the scenario of, of the, the young generations, um, and of course, yeah, local local supply chain. The more the more uh, as possible, um, especially SMEs, which are the the, the greatest part of, of the of the of the companies uh, scenarios in every single country. So we, we, we do now uh, the third challenge. We, we believe we are ready for that. Um, leverage upon more than 10 years of, of knowledge and of operation. Uh, it's not a paper turbine. It's not a paper platform. They, these, are, these are real projects where people can go and see. And, and, and I can assure you that every day there's a, a, something that we are learning that will be very useful when we come down to uh, uh, the next auctions. So it's important that the, 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 w the governments and that rule out, uh, that rule the, 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 um, the regulation or that set the regulation forward, uh, need to understand that in these initial phases, only the experienced ones, not only the financial capable ones, but the experienced ones are, are the ones that can deliver. So that is something that I, that I wanted to, to address. Um, it's, uh, we proved that it's bankable, uh, and now we need the volume, we need to industrialize it, we need to keep on doing innovation so that the LCOE, the levelized cost of energy, for the ones that are not as familiar with this term, um, becomes uh, the ones that we all expire, uh, the, the, one that we, the ones that we all intended to, to be levelized with others, uh, so that we are not the elephant in the room. And, and the volume is there. And this is only European Union, I'm sorry for that. Uh, if we add on uh, Norway and the UK, the, the numbers will almost double. Um, so, so the opportunity is there. We need to be very much, um, not only ambitious, ambitious, I think we, all, we, are, uh, we are already ambitious. I, I believe that we need to be very demanding. Each one of us needs to be very demanding. Because otherwise, we'll never get there. We'll never, we'll, we, we saw here a number of, of aspects that need to be addressed. <laughs> and there are so many. Uh, and now with, with, the, with inflation and, and, the, and raw material prices, even worse, yeah, right? So we need to be very demanding um, to get there. It's not only an environmental issue. I'm not here delivering an environmentalist uh, uh, speech. But I think that what is underlying is that this is a brilliant, and tremendous economic opportunity for many countries, for, for the countries themselves and for the companies that want to, to be in this business. As this is going to be, I am sure that we will all give this as granted in 10 years' time, this will be one of the major industries of Europe. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, Jose, for offering your perspective to the conversation. I uh, like your statement about stop talking about potential and start talking about doing it. So we'll talk a bit more about potential, but we will also uh, talk about how to do it today. Uh, so next up, we have a presentation entitled North Adriatic, the best offshore wind site in the Mediterranean. Uh, Professor Nevin Duic from the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architectures in Croatia uh, will tell us a bit more about what lies behind this bold statement and the prospects for offshore wind development in Croatia and the Adriatic Sea. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know that uh, Saidi is lower in countries with more wind, so if Greece had more wind, we would probably not have this uh, 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 short uh, uh, break of uh, power uh, supply. Uh, we are going to move to more electrified uh, society and most of the final energy demand will either be covered with electricity or with uh, 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 fuels produced from electricity like hydrogen and other e-fuels. Uh, and this is going to be uh, supplied mostly by uh, wind. Will, wind will soon become the major uh, source of electricity in Europe. Uh, and by 2050, around 50% 50 of all uh, electricity demand will be supplied by wind. Uh, we are uh, now going deeper and deeper and further and further from uh, the coast. And uh, as you can see, there are already breach slowly of the 40 meter uh, depth limit. Uh, this is important information when we will look into northern Croatia, Croatia uh, situation. Uh, up to now, there was not much activity in Mediterranean. Most of the activity was in uh, North Sea and Baltic Sea, but we are going to start seeing much more activity in the Mediterranean. Uh, and, uh, well, if we look at uh, the wind potential, it looks obviously it's the best uh, on, uh, in French coast and in uh, Greek coast, uh, but there is an issue there. Um, uh, one thing is that uh, if we want to use the current technology, uh, then uh, Cro Northern Croatian uh, Adriatic Sea is actually quite fit to that. It's relatively flat uh, 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 bottom of, uh, of the sea. If we look at the depth uh, issue, then we can see that uh, uh, Croatian Northern Adriatic has quite a lot of uh, uh, areas which are, uh, well, mainly around 40 to 50 meters, so it's a bit on the edge. Uh, for the fixed uh, wind turbines. Uh, there is a lot of place, of course, for floating, which we have seen from the first speaker. Uh, but if we uh, want to go with the current technology, then we are just a little bit on the edge. There is also a very good position down there near Tuni Tunisia, but I will explain later why we think that the Mediterranean Northern Adriatic is actually quite quite a good position. The problem with uh, both Greek and uh, French areas is that they are quite deep, so they will be mostly for when the floating wind uh, comes. Uh, if we go closer to the uh, uh, northern Adriatic, the wind is very strong near the coast, but it's not a very good wind. We tried it and uh, the results are very bad uh, because of the vortexes, which are vertical, when the wind descends down from the mountain. So the best location we see is uh, around the tip of Istria Peninsula, uh, where the depth is just on the edge of 40 and uh, the wind is actually still quite, uh, quite good. But um, most of this uh, northern Adriatic area has this limit area on the, on the both sides. Uh, uh, okay, if we look at uh, bathymetry, um, it is 40, around 40 meters depth, the northern Adriatic. So, uh, these are the possible locations for development of uh, uh, offshore wind. 
this does not include, uh, include uh, shipping uh, pathways. Um, and these can be relatively easily organized under the same concession rules as uh, uh, gas uh, uh, production which exists in that area at the moment. Getting closer to the coast might be tricky from the point of view of uh, tourism because we are a tourist country and uh, tourists probably don't want to see too much on their beautiful horizon. But 20 kilometers away, uh, they don't see anything anyway because fortunately uh, Earth is uh, rounded. Uh, so uh, if we look at this A and B, which are uh, options for uh, fixed uh, floor, uh, and then we have a C and D, uh, which are probably for the floating. Uh, we have quite a lot of area which could be looked into. Um, we did um, a very preliminary calculations and we see up to a maximum of five gigawatt in A and B zones and around 10 gigawatt in uh, C and D zones, and that's only on the Croatian side of the economic zone. There is also Italian side, which has approximately uh, the same amounts. Uh, we can see here uh, monthly uh, distribution of uh, wind uh, f uh, uh, and how much we think could be produced if everything was developed. Um, and then we come to uh, probably the most important reason why we think this is a good area because uh, quite a lot of demand is uh, very close to this area. Tunisia is probably better from the point of view of wind and uh, bathymetry, but uh, here we have uh, lots of demand. Uh, unfortunately, the grid is much better on the Italian side than on the Croatian side. Currently, we have uh, only 220 kilovolts uh, uh, connection uh, nearby, but this could be doubled. So maybe around 500 megawatt could be relatively easily uh, uh, evacuated on the Croatian side and much more on the Italian side. So we would need to develop uh, quite a lot of uh, inland grid in order to improve uh, uh, the location. So uh, since these projects are 10 years, uh, also as offshore wind, we should start thinking about them uh, probably uh, now. So Adriatic uh, Sea shows a great deployment potential for offshore wind energy. And I'm very happy that uh, the first speaker also has shown Croatia as very much uh, potential place. Um, and uh, what we see, we could uh, easily produce up to 80% of uh, all energy from offshore wind, uh, but we will need large new transmission lines planned, and they're not yet planned. Uh, so we have to start thinking about that uh, quickly. And we think that if we keep this uh, distance from the shore, uh, we can make it uh, compatible with uh, tourism, which is very important uh, uh, for us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nevin. Uh, personally, I would love to go on holiday to Croatia and look at offshore windmills, but I suppose people are different. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Sebastian Enas. Uh, who is a board member at the Romanian uh, Wind Energy Association. Uh, Sebastian will give a presentation on offshore wind in the Black Sea with a focus on people, skills and management and the transfer uh, from oil and gas to renewables. So the floor is yours. Hello everybody. Uh, very nice presentations and uh, I see that uh, a lot of markets are uh, developing, are under development, but uh, unfortunately in Romania we are only speaking about offshore. There is a uh, pressure on the offshore law. There is no uh, spatial planning, so probably there will not be any offshore in the next five years, but at least uh, the hope is to 
prepare a law that will prepare the offshore uh, industry at least. From the Romanian Wind Energy Association point of view, uh, onshore has been uh, a priority for the government because it has uh, easy access, good wind speed, and it's normal that offshore will come later on. And the wind speed is pretty uh, average, between 7 and 8 meters per second. So this is why the priority was uh, for onshore. But if we look on all the offshore wind maps, we see that the entire offshore capacity is going higher and higher in Europe. For now, Romania, it's not in the statistics, but it's only in the statistics for the, the potential. Probably the way our things are happening right now, in Romania we will not have offshore wind uh, in 2028, and probably the first uh, plannings, developments, and investors are arriving 2023, 2024, so probably 2026 we will have uh, something uh, palpable. Anyway, uh, the potential is good. The potential uh, is there. We, we have now, uh, uh, we're facing the situation that we're very close to Ukraine, so everything needs to be uh, planned uh, in a way that uh, the economical zone and uh, the wind uh, areas should be uh, put in a way to, to cover this risk as well. Nevertheless, uh, what we've seen is that uh, this is a constant wind. It's a good wind. Uh, and uh, probably uh, we, we will be able to install more floating than, uh, yeah, more floating turbines. Uh, Monson, and I'm speaking also from the Monson side as a developer, I'm also representing Monson, uh, is a large developer. We, uh, we are focused mainly on onshore and what I can say is that uh, a lot of investors and developers are doing a lot of lobby in Romania to start offshore. Um, as, as, as you can see in water depths, uh, we are more suitable for floating, as I, as I told you. Uh, some of the institutes in Romania already started to do um, environmental assessments. Uh, we started to, to work on papers to promote to the government uh, the possibility that uh, also, uh, as my former colleague said, uh, tourism can uh, go along with, uh, with offshore wind because we also have um, the windiest uh, area uh, close to the shore and also it's the, the only touristic uh, seaside uh, area of Romania. So we're also facing a bit of debate on, on this topic. It's, uh, I would prefer Croatian shore than Romanian shore, but also Romania <laughs> is, uh, is nice. Um, in, uh, in regards to, to resources and to, to assessments, uh, we see, as I told you, more potential near, uh, near the shore. But of course, the floating uh, technology, as they will advance and uh, they go lower in cost, um, I think it will be uh, wider spread. The problem we have, uh, I think it's the first presentation, is not the... If, if you can change the presentation, the, the last draft, nevertheless, it's still, uh, it's still on. So if we look at the Romanian grid, uh, we are facing a uh, capacity constraint uh, because Dobroja uh, is the windiest area in Romania. So here we have around 75% of the onshore wind. And it's also the point that uh, we will connect offshore wind. So uh, in these regards, uh, we are facing a capacity constraint. Right now, uh, there are discussions to add an additional uh, 9 gigawatts of new installed capacity for onshore solar and wind. And probably the targets of the Romanian government as uh, publicly stated in the uh, draft law, uh, there are around uh, 1 gigawatt of new, uh, of new installations in offshore. As I said, probably 
the offshore um, the offshore will will be a bit late. Uh, I'm trying to see if I will continue this or we can because they're they're quite different. Uh, I will uh, I will try to go on and explain yeah uh, something uh, something about reskilling and then may probably the you can help me change the the presentation. Nevertheless, uh, Romania. Uh, is a very good location from the offshore point of view because we have an existing offshore uh, industry for oil and gas. Uh, this means that we have the infrastructure. What we've seen in the last five years is that Romania has been a very good uh, onshore technician wind hub. As Poland, probably Romanians and Polish are the, the, the most present uh, technicians for installation, service and maintenance if not in Europe, but in the entire world. So uh, we have a zero existing uh, offshore uh, wind industry in Romania, but at least 1,500 te offshore technicians, Romanian offshore technicians, work all over the world. So uh, from the um, uh, competitivity point of view, the, the manpower is already there and all the people uh, would be happy to come home and work for the offshore industry rather than work abroad. Uh, what we've also seen in the last five years is that a lot of technicians from oil and gas switched to renewables. Yeah, so we have two types of uh, onshore technicians. Offshore engineers from oil and gas that were reconverted to onshore wind and now they have onshore wind experience, but also offshore experience from oil and gas. It means that uh, the human resources can be very uh, easy uh, converted uh, from onshore to offshore. Also, uh, what I wanted to present and probably uh, will change the presentation is that, yeah? No, no, no. I can, I can, uh, I can, uh, I, I can, I, I can explain. What, what we've seen in the wind industry, and everybody knows, is that you can build thousands of hundreds of new megawatts, but you have a limited uh, resource capacity in regards to people that will install it, people that will manage it, maintain it. Yeah, and through uh, through the Romanian Wind Energy Association and through the European Commission. We've started a program, a reskilling program for uh, coal region in transition. So there is a program uh, funded and created by the European uh, Commission, coal region in transition. So what we've said is that, okay, at least let, let's make a case study. In Romania, we have 20,000 miners that will be out of jobs starting in the next two or three years. So the phase out started by 2032. All the mines in Romania will be shut down and we have 20,000 high skilled electricians, uh, people that know mechanical and hydraulical engineering that work in the mines that will be out of jobs. And we've prepared a 10 year plan and I think also the Polish Wind uh, Association is doing the same. Uh, we've draft a 10 year plan to reskill all the miners and the people working uh, aside the mining industry that will be out of jobs into renewables, solar, onshore wind and offshore wind. And uh, I wanted to show you a case study. We've, uh, we, we, have, we have this uh, very interesting changing hearts and minds program because most of the miners say that they will be out of jobs because of renewables. Yeah, okay, so you're closing the mines because you have now wind and solar, so you don't need us anymore, yeah? So uh, what we actually did was uh, bringing more than 1,000 miners in wind turbines, onshore wind turbines all over Romania and uh, the results were that now, uh, I, let's see if, uh, no it's the same, <laughs> I 
Okay, so the results were that now 50% uh, of the miners in Romania support renewables. It was 3% two years ago, yeah? And through, through the program, we have a target to reskill 1,000 miners in three years. We already are 45% there. And what we did, we did a circular program. So first, uh, so we got some EU funds to train them. And we trained them for wind and solar. It's around 10,000 euro worth of uh, courses. It's uh, a program that can last one month, three months, or six months. It's a very quick reconversion program because actually it's not reskilling, but it's upskilling. You have a mechanical engineer that will only need to know some turbine knowledge, yeah? Uh, it's a hydraulical engineer that you need to upskill, yeah? So what we, what we do is, is train them for one, three, or six months, depending on uh, what they want. Maybe they want to be a blade technician, maybe they want to be an offshore blade technician. Uh, then uh, we send them to work with our teams or the, the teams of the companies in the association for one month or two months in order to create the job experience for them. Yes, and then uh, we have a hub that these people can be hired into the industry. So what can I, uh, what, what I, uh, let's say the, 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 the plan is to get them from the mines and hire them into uh, the industry. Thank you very much. Let's see. I didn't finish it, <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much for the presentation. That is the new one. <laughs> but just, uh, I, I will be, uh, so, so, so this is the, the, the workforce and reskilling program that I was telling you. Uh, these are uh, fictional people that uh, we had into a poll. We had um, 2,000 miners telling, uh, telling us their opinion about uh, if they want to work in uh, onshore and offshore wind. And uh, what, what we have also as a prob problem is that all the miners will get to their pension at 45. Yeah, so at 45, they will be very, uh, they, they'll, get, they'll get pension for I think 1,500 euro per month. So uh, at, at one point you'll be facing uh, a very good man or woman that can work, but they will don't want to work because they have enough money to sustain themselves, yeah? So also, uh, it was a good uh, catch that offshore wind is better paid than mining, so uh, this would attract them. So we, on one side, are trying to convert miners to renewables. On the other side, the old miners will never want to work. So we had this, this problem that we had to, to face. Um, and um, how, we, how we did it, was that uh, the first 30% uh, of the trainees uh, get an additional grant from the state. So actually, uh, at least uh, for, for Romania, uh, we managed to, to tell them that uh, working in a mine, uh, working for renewables, it's always, as you know, uh, better paid than, uh, than working in the mines, yeah? Uh, but in Romania, we had a problem, they were paid the same. So a regular miner got around 3,000 euro per month net in their pocket. Yeah. So government supporting mining industry by paying them similar jobs. So uh, depending on each state and how they subsidize the mining industry, probably a Europe-wide uh, program such as this may be affected by the differences in payment. This is also something that, uh, that we discovered. Nevertheless, what we are designing now is to create the infrastructure for the existing training centers through the GWO uh, um, standard or to different standards for wind. And also we are working with the Photovoltaic Wind Association to create a special curricula uh, with a training matrix and a skills matrix between miners and the wind industry in order to be able to absorb or to push from these energy transition industries to the, uh, uh, to the renewable uh, industries.
Is it on? Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, so welcome back. If everyone could please uh, take their seats. Uh, we'll uh, start. So uh, we have two more present. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> we have uh, two more presentations before uh, the panel discussion. Uh, our next speaker is Kaupo Lenerand. Uh, Vice Minister for Maritime Economy in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications in Estonia. So uh, you will tell us a bit about offshore wind in the Baltic Sea, which holds an incredible potential uh, and is also enclosed by eight countries. So that's an interesting, uh, yeah, interesting uh, situation. <laughs> uh, I will let you tell us more about that. And uh, yeah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will give a short presentation about uh, offshore wind potential in Estonia. So, we are a maritime nation in the northeastern shores of uh, Baltic Sea. As you can see, uh, we are in eight places of renewable energy, and uh, uh, we are using the, in transport renewable sources uh, around 12 percent, which is uh, which brings us to the fifth place. And, uh, and electricity, 29% and 15 place. So there is a lot of uh, uh, room for evolvement in this area because uh, Estonia is a cold country. It's all the time cold. Maybe three months will be a little bit better. Uh, we have improved in uh, using renewable sources in, in heating and uh, cooling. So it's almost 60% in there. So. So this area is really good. Many years ago, we were quite independent nation of you, uh, in, in terms of energy because we were using uh, oil shale for energy production. So we were independent of uh, other resources outside of Estonia. When uh, we speak about uh, uh, Baltic Sea, it's, uh, it's uh, 365,000 square kilometers, and and it it has huge potential for uh, for offshore wind production, and it's really, really now it's only around two gigawatts, but uh, but I'm I'm quite sure that it will be new place for uh, big development projects uh, as North Sea at the moment. So uh, when we speak about Estonian sea area, it's, uh, it's around 10% uh, of, uh, of total Baltic Sea, uh, and, uh, and the land mass is uh, equal to, to, the, to the sea area. And, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's cold in Estonia, but it's also windy, so that's good. Uh, we want to get, uh, 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 get to, let's say, we want to use less uh, oil shale, we are in favor of green transition, so, so offshore wind uh, offers huge opportunity for us, uh, and uh, there is more uh, than we need, uh, there is more potential than we need, and uh, potential for export as well in the future. The offshore wind areas in Estonia, it's, uh, it's around 1,700 square kilometers, which is, uh, which is really really huge area and uh, uh, potential in the in this area is uh, more than uh, seven uh, gigawatts uh, when uh, when we speak about offshore wind uh, principles of developing in Estonian principles then we are really seeking of uh, market-based solutions uh, uh, all all investments all future projects are really welcome to Estonia and, uh, and initiatives uh, uh, and also we are really uh, glad if, if uh, the value chain behind, as previous speaker mentioned, the value chain behind uh, supports, uh, supports uh, local communities because it also, has, uh, let's say, helps to reduce the uh, effect of uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. And we are expecting really to huge scale up after 2030 uh, and also the construction before so challenges in uh, in offshore wind uh, uh, development in estonia like everywhere the licensing 
super fishes licenses, uh, maritime spatial planning, uh, building acts. So, so we have been really busy of, uh, uh, of preparing uh, all kind of acts uh, to support faster process of, of uh, uh, building and uh, developing offshore wind. The challenge is always is uh, local support uh, and not in my backyard and visual impact. Uh, this actually, we have had a lot of discussion over the years and, uh, and it has improved a lot, especially, let's say, for example, I visited the island of Saremo, which is uh, the island here, the big island. Around, uh, around which there are a lot of uh, future development areas. And uh, if we compare uh, the attitude uh, towards offshore wind energy, it has completely changed. And uh, uh, the, the local uh, people understand even more and more the importance of the offshore wind and uh, what positive sides it brings with it. And also, the geopolitical situation, energy independence and, and independence fit for 55, it all helps to, to, to boost uh, the development. Uh, with the fisheries, uh, uh, always challenge, uh, but uh, we have uh, excluded main trolling areas uh, with the envir envir environmentalist side. Uh, we have uh, also taken into account as maximum as possible uh, when we were uh, when we were planning uh, the uh, areas for wind energy so definitely challenge the ports in Estonia there are a lot of ports uh, uh, who really are ambitions to be construction ports of the offshore wind energy one is especially have made big progress, uh, one of the deep water ports of Estonia, and uh, they, ha they have really ambitious uh, plans uh, to support in uh, overall countries the, the building process, and they have huge areas behind the free land uh, to develop value chain, to, to store all kinds of equipment uh, for building. Always greed, greed is a challenge, uh, because uh, uh, we are using more and more uh, uh, electrical energy and uh, the, the new grids are critical for developing the offshore wind energy. And of, of course, always the financing part of, uh, of uh, offshore wind. So we try to interrupt the market as less as possible and, uh, and uh, try to give chance uh, for others to invest so here you can see Estonian maritime spatial planning, the 1,700 kilometers of, uh, of areas are uh, the ones which are uh, let, hatched uh, or cross-hatched and uh, uh, there, are, there are already many big players there making environmental assessment with the ships and, uh, and uh, uh, have uh, have, let's say, applied for different kind of licenses. Uh, the areas, a uh, lot of areas are on the west of island of Saarema, here, and a uh, and, uh, lot of areas in the, in the southeast, eastern part of island of Saarema. So they are, uh, they are located in internal waters, territorial waters, and some of them in economic exclusive zone. And, uh, the depth is ideal for construction. It's uh, are around, uh, let's say, between 17 meters and 35 meters. Uh, uh, you don't have to uh, make constructions too deep. And uh, with the planning, we have excluded the defense areas. We have chosen the best uh, wind areas, excluded the bat migration, bird migration, main trolling areas. So. We have prepared really long time to make uh, very good uh, maritime spatial planning. So if uh, investments or developers come, then it's, it's going to happen faster because uh, uh, those impacts will be, will be less. Uh, when we continue, uh, then there is uh, uh, 
crucial project for us. It's a cooperation between, uh, between uh, Estonia and Latvia. It's a joint hybrid uh, offshore project. It's a piloting project to show that uh, cross-border hybrid projects are possible. If, if this, uh, if this project uh, succeeds, and I'm 100% uh, sure it will succeed, then uh, uh, it's, uh, let's say, it shows the way for other countries to uh, develop together offshore wind energy. And uh, we, this is more like, uh, if all those other areas uh, are more like for, for uh, energy export, for development, because Estonia is a small nation, 1.3 million, we don't need all the potential uh, of the electricity energy, what, uh, what there is. Uh, this one is for energy independence, so together with land, uh, land uh, wind uh, potential and uh, offshore wind potential, it covers our, our needs. All others are extra development possibilities. So uh, for this, uh, we are planning uh, to call out the auction, auction to find a cooperator in 2025-26. Uh, there are at the moment uh, uh, feasibility studies going on for the best locations because the area is uh, quite uh, huge and, uh, and we hope the park to be operational in 2030. Uh, in uh, cost and uh, benefits, uh, uh, they are shared equally 50-50 in, uh, in this project and uh, uh, we are really looking uh, for this project uh, because it, uh, it requires uh, cross uh, between countries, the, the hybrid uh, grid uh, network shared by many, many countries, then we hope it to be the, the first stage for future developments. So Baltic Sea offshore grid, that's, uh, that's as you can see, uh, when we continue with our green transition and, uh, and producing uh, green uh, energy, green hydrogen in the future, then uh, um, developing uh, offshore wind areas, then, then this, this uh, Baltic Sea offshore grid uh, as the backbone of offshore wind development is definitely a uh, huge uh, opportunity for all of us because it uh, helps to, to reduce uh, costs between countries and, uh, and, uh, and of course the the cross-nation cooperation, it's, it's always takes maybe a little bit uh, more time, but it's, it's really uh, forward-looking and, uh, and helps, to, helps to be cost-effective. And, uh, and also for energy independence, energy security, it, uh, it's easy to, to share um, electricity via the grid uh, between other countries. So it's definitely essential for moving on with this project and uh, a lot of countries has already joined it. So if you speak about uh, offshore wind development in Estonia, then uh, uh, we are all also preparing and it's mostly already ready the offshore wind roadmap for future, which uh, shows exactly the, the main stages where we need to continue to develop and uh, and especially focusing uh, on the on the different aspects as developing the farms the maritime spatial planning all kind of licenses everything which is involved with developing the park also the, we have construction ports uh, where we have really huge ambitions and ideal uh, geographical location to help to build uh, wind farms, offshore wind farms across the Baltic Sea. Also, the, as you saw, the island of Saarema, a lot of uh, offshore wind farms are around of this island, so there is huge potential for competence center uh, as in to, to, be, to be developed in this island with future competences on it. And, uh, and we are really looking forward for all investments to our development areas as you see we have potential more than we need so and we have really prepared everything for future investments and uh, are uh, supporting cross-country cooperation uh, and uh, 
uh, very good cooperation between uh, uh, different kind of consortiums uh, and countries uh, to develop uh, the new possibilities. So, so welcome uh, to Estonia. You can find me in LinkedIn and uh, I will contact you with the right person in Enterprise Estonia or government uh, to get, get you, get you uh, new contacts and uh, core network inside Estonia. Thank you. Kaupu for this invitation to collaborate. I hope uh, many people will take you up on that. Uh, so the last speaker of the day is uh, Panagiotis Ladakakos, president of the Hellenic Wind Energy Association here in Greece. Uh, so you will tell us about offshore wind in Greece, an industry that is still in the starting blocks, but that is really starting to see the potential for floating offshore wind. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I will speak about Greece. Uh, first of all, I would like to give you a, a brief status of where Greece stands today in terms of wind energy development. And to be very uh, clear from the beginning, uh, currently we have zero wind turbines installed in our waters. So. All the figures I'm going to show you are uh, concerning onshore wind installations. Um, this is the evolution of the cumulative evolution of annual wind energy installations in the country. So the statistics ending at the end of 2021 uh, give us a total figure of 4,451 uh, megawatts installed in the country. A little bit more interesting is this slide, which shows the new annual installations of wind farms in Greece, both in the mainland, interconnected mainland, and the Greek islands. Uh, and this is a split also per uh, wind turbine uh, supplier. As you will notice, Greece in the last decade used to be a not so big uh, market. Uh, figures between 150 to 250 new megawatts were installed. Uh, 2019 was a record year for our country where we installed uh, something less than uh, 800 megawatts. And the last couple of years, we have an increased activity versus the previous years, but smaller in comparison to the uh, 2019. Those figures are not sufficient for Greece in order to meet its targets. Our targets as we speak today are discussed because we have continuous revisions of the National Energy and Climate Plan. And these revisions are due to the more ambitious targets of the European community, the Green Deal package, but also recently due to the Repower EU package which relates to the, uh, let's say, to becoming less and less dependent from uh, natural gas coming from Russia, but natural gas and, uh, you know, uh, fossil fuels coming from ev everywhere at the final end. So our targets, as are being discussed currently, not yet officially in the revised plan, are speaking for 25 gigawatt renewables by 2030 in our system. And today we have something around 9 gigawatt of renewables, 4.5 wind and 4.5 PV and some other uh, smaller uh, types of renewables like biomass, uh, small hydros, uh, etc. So as you can understand from where we stand today, we need to go to a figure that is more or less 1 gigawatt per year for the next uh, eight years. It's a, a speaking for wind energy only, which, as I will show you, it's quite difficult to achieve speaking about onshore wind only. This is how wind farms are being distributed uh, geographically in the country. Central Greece is dominating the installations. The main concept of this slide is to show that where we have the biggest wind potential in the country, which is the Aegean Sea, and the Aegean Sea is the sea between Greece and Turkey. 
we have very, very limited installations because practically we have non-interconnected small islands which cannot support the installation, the massive installation of uh, renewables due to the lack of uh, grid interconnections. Uh, this is a map, uh, you can visit this map uh, from the website of the association which shows the spatial distribution of the installed capacity. Uh, the dots are installed wind farms in the country, so you can see roughly uh, where the majority of the wind installations exist. These dots are a little bit misleading because even if a wind farm is a one wind turbine or a 50 or 80 megawatt wind turbine, it's the same dot. Okay, but it gives you the picture where onshore the wind potential lies. Okay, let's see a little bit uh, offshore. I have seen this slide before by one of the previous speakers. Uh, this slide uh, gives the big picture of where the wind potential in Greece uh, exists. We believe, and this is well proven from all wind measurements around the complex of our uh, smaller, bigger islands, we have a huge wind potential in the Aegean Sea. And this uh, wind potential at the moment is uh, non-exploitable. There are various reasons that uh, we still haven't seen offshore wind in our waters. There are technical reasons, there are financial reasons, and there are also uh, administrative political reasons. The main technical barrier until recently was the depth of our waters. Because as one of our speakers said uh, uh, before, Greece has indeed very deep waters, so bottom fixed is not an option with a very, very few exceptions that, uh, you know, practically is not the rule, is the exception of the rule. Our waters are lacking uh, transmission capacity because we do not have, uh, the, the, most of the islets are not interconnected, so there is not any real infrastructure to connect this wind farm, but this is changing. Our system operator has a very, very ambitious plan on interconnecting the majority of the islands uh, in our seas, and this is important. We have significant maritime infrastructure focused on other activities, not on offshore wind. We have shipyards, we have ports, we have a very strong uh, industry producing cables and other activities which need adjustment in order to be able to serve uh, the, the ambitious targets of uh, offshore wind in the future. Uh, I'm referring here to political uh, geostrategical constraints more or less our main geostrategical constraint is our neighbor and most of you might know that we have several disputes about our waters and the, the uh, border zones of our waters and this is a parameter that also should be considered in the exercise when we make our maritime spatial planning. The next big discussion that was a, a limiting parameter all the previous years for development of offshore wind in Greece was costs. Uh, I will go into some slides about costs, but I would like also to give you beforehand the big picture of the Mediterranean Sea in order to have a comparative figure. You have seen this slide before in the morning, so we don't need to lose time. The big picture is that the biggest wind potential in Mediterranean Sea exists in the Aegean Sea and in south of France. This is what the wind atlas say, so we need as a priority to exploit this wind potential in our seas. What comes as a game changer the last two, three years in our country? Floating offshore wind. Floating wind turbines are the parameter that change the discussion in the country. Projects like the first project in uh, Scotland by the Scandinavians, by Equin or Highwind. Uh, projects like uh, Wind Float Atlantic showed that floating wind is realistic, is possible, is well proven. It is entering from a semi-commercial stage to a full commercial stage. It can be fully bankable and it works. This gives us, the, uh, let's say, the additional um, uh, weapons to, to go to our administration and our political leadership 
and ask to open the market because I'm not so sure that you all know, but as we speak, it is not allowed by a developer in Greece to develop a wind farm in our seas. We are expecting to have a new law that will open the market for uh, offshore wind in hopefully the next uh, few weeks. The target is to have a new legislation by the end of June. This will be a significant milestone because this will allow private developments and uh, companies, domestic and international, and international to, to, to work together and to develop uh, wind farms in our seas. Uh, one of the parameters that was uh, important to convince uh, our uh, politicians to open the market was also the local content concept. And I'm not speaking from a regulatory approach because local content in Europe cannot be uh, demanded. But I'm speaking from reality because our op opinion is that Greece, if it is one of the prime movers, and there has been a lot of discussion this morning about who can be a prime mover, but if we are a prime mover in our region, we can be not only a supplier of local content for Greek offshore wind farms, but of wind farms in the at least uh, 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 Southeast Mediterranean region, and why not in all the Mediterranean region? Uh, so, as, as things stand today, everybody in Greece, all the political parties, think that uh, offshore wind is a must for, uh, for Greece, and I th would say there is a strong political consensus to go to the next, uh, to the next steps. The main constraint that the last couple of years what you could hear from the administration is that floating wind is very expensive. So somebody could argue that if we open uh, very soon our market for uh, floating wind, then we will have a very fast development of huge amounts of green electricity that would cost several times higher than maybe a conventional PV plant in the country or a conventional wind farm in the country. The approach which you, most of you, I suppose, are aware is that if a market opens today, it will be active after several years and the first wind, wind farms in the sea, we will experience them if we do it after six, seven years, I think it will be a success. So somebody has to see the cost trend of the LCOE of, of floating wind. And the cost trend is very uh, promising because all the studies show that more or less the path that conventional bottom fixed offshore wind followed the previous decade can be followed also by offshore wind. The exercise needs volume, needs visibility, and needs what everybody calls as industrialization. Okay. The Hellenic Wind Energy Association undertook uh, somehow the responsibility to advise the ministry and to suggest uh, uh, the critical uh, legislation for the new opening of the market, uh, which, as I discussed before, is expected to take place the following weeks. We made a public consultation to all our members. We raised several questions. The four fundamental questions, five, are the ones listed in this graph. Uh, it's not an easy exercise for Greece to finalize how the evolvement of offshore wind will take place because from, from conventional uh, renewables, we have had good but also bad experiences. So we try to avoid the bad experience that we have had in onshore uh, renewables. We try also to see what are the good practices and the good experiences from the other countries. So at the final end, we have made some suggestions to the government and we have proposed an approach on how possibly development could be initiated in the country. You can find this uh, approach and this uh, study in our, website. in our website. It's quite detailed and it's, it follows a step-by-step, -step, uh, uh, let's say, a safe approach in order to have the soonest possible uh, wind farms in Greece. Uh, everybody who is active in Greece has to know that 
there is a fundamental issue that we have to act soon and upgrade our grid because our grid has many limitations for the further expansion of renewables. If we see the big targets that I referred in the beginning about 2030 and much more the ambitious targets going towards 2050, then we have to make a lot of upgrades and these upgrades have also to, to consider the seas. This is the map of the high voltage and ultra high voltage network in Greece not as it is today, but also as it is planned for the next decade. This slide comes from the 10-year national plan of the system operator. As you will notice in our uh, waters, there are a lot of grids. Okay, you see here, all these grids connecting the islands. All these are future, uh, future plans. The system operator has proven to be very reliable the last years in Greece, and the 10-year plan is binding. So what we see here as plans, it's quite uh, safe to say that we will see it uh, after the, during the, this decade. Currently, the system operator is building uh, one of the most important uh, infrastructures of our country, which is the DC interconnection between Attica. Attica is the broader region of Athens, connecting to Crete. And this is considered to be due to the depths of our waters and the, system, the seismic difficulties presented in the bottom of our waters as one of the most complicated uh, underwater cables interconnecting uh, uh, two different uh, networks in the world. Uh, the plan is that we will have this, uh, uh, this grid, which is this grid. <coughs> We will have it uh, operational uh, uh, in the next one or two years. This will by itself uh, upgrade significantly the capacities of our system to absorb uh, electricity. Still, although we have a very ambitious plan for the upgrade of our network, although we have already assumed the connection of various of our islands, many more grids are needed in order to, to, to adjust the, infrastructure, the electrical infrastructure of the country to the needs and the requirements of the massive exploitation of uh, offshore wind. Now I will uh, finish with this slide. This is some proposals for immediate actions in order to boost uh, offshore wind in Greece. Uh, first of all, as I said, we expect to have the new framework. It needs to have a clear and detailed roadmap on how everybody will move forward. Uh, we need targets, we need clear targets. Our Prime Minister has recently announced a target which is 2 gigawatt installed uh, in our uh, waters by 2030, which is an ambitious target for Greece, if you consider that still the market has not opened, uh, new developments cannot be applied. Uh, we need to see the maritime spatial plan and the spatial plan for renewables, and those spatial plans have to be well uh, interconnected. W uh, Greece does not have yet a maritime spatial plan. It's under process. Um, we also need to see the upgrade of our infrastructure. As I said, we have a lot of maritime infrastructure, but none of this is at the moment ready to serve uh, the large size of wind turbines that are planned to be installed the next years worldwide, or I hope including Greece. We said about the system operator and the need to upgrade grids. And the last thing that we believe will also uh, be a catalyst for the further deployment of offshore wind is to have a couple of pilot projects that will be installed on our waters. And when I say pilot projects, I'm not referring to two, three wind turbines in our sea. I'm referring to projects of at least 200, 250 megawatts to be uh, operated on an as possible fast track basis in order to start having the market uh, adjusting to the needs of offshore wind. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you so much uh, Panagiotis. Uh, so I will now invite uh, all the speakers up to the stage for a panel discussion. Uh,
Yeah, uh, the speaker from Romania, Sebastian, had to catch a plane, but I think we will still be uh, well represented. Uh, while you are finding your seats, I can also remind everyone that there is the matchmaking upstairs at 2. Uh, there are still some meetings available, and you should also go into the platform and check if you have any pending meeting requests. Sorry. <laughs> oh, maybe I should have the watch. Uh, yeah, so we'll have a 30 minute panel discussion. I think uh, I'll take a little bit of your, or 25, a little bit of your lunch break, but not too much. Um, okay. Uh, so thank you all for very interesting. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you all for very interesting presentations. Uh, there are many, many topics here to dig into, so I think we'll just get started. Um, is there a problem with the... With my mic? I don't... You have to close my mic. Okay. Uh, so, first off, the, the main reason we are here, international collaboration. Uh, an overall theme of this conference is how companies, innovation clusters, research institutes and others uh, can collaborate on blue growth in Europe. So, let's hear your, your reflections on business collaboration in offshore wind, starting with you, uh, Tuir Arne. Uh, you told us a bit about the Horizon 2020 project flagship. Uh, could you speak a bit more about how you think Norwegian actors can collaborate with the countries represented here uh, uh, to form partnerships for EU projects and maybe also how you work in the cluster to, to build such partnerships? Uh, yes, uh, a very good uh, question. Um, I, I will start in another way than you asked. Uh, that's typical uh, politicians, right? Um, and I think uh, the most important thing for collaboration between different countries is to, to create the capacity to deliver. Uh, I don't think one port or uh, one fabrication is going to deliver all to one wind turbine farm. You need uh, several ports, you need uh, several deliveries, so and Norwegian companies can't do that in Norway, so they need to cooperate. Uh, that's one aspect that I also mentioned earlier uh, today, uh, local content, um, it's kind of the elephant in the room so to speak. Uh, everyone is talking about local content, or, and if you want to have local content, uh, then you need to cooperate with local stakeholders. Uh, over to the EU uh, part, uh, as I said, um, I think EU project is kind of um, a playing field, it's kind of a training uh, facility for uh, the real world. So if you go into EU projects, uh, you play there together with the people that you want to play with. If that doesn't function, you don't uh, play with them when you are going commercial. How we do that? Um, we start by looking at calls, EU calls focusing on uh, floating offshore wind. Uh, and we uh, check our 360 companies who is eager to go into the calls. And then we start from there. We also have one other aspect, uh, Windfloat Atlantic was mentioned. Uh, we also have a test center in Norway called Marine Energy Test Center that uh, has uh, two turbines installed now. Uh, in, in the future, 2026 is going to be seven, eight turbines installed. Uh, capacity up to 80 megawatt. So it's really a floating offshore wind farm, maybe the world's first. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jakob, you uh, invited international actors to collaborate with the Polish uh, offshore wind market. Uh, and you also said you were lacking some, some competencies. Could you say a bit more about what sort of competencies you, you are in need of in the Polish market? Well, uh let me start the same mode like at all <laughs> from the another end. Uh, in Poland, we have a very specific situation because uh, the Polish uh, offshore supply chain is really existing and doing a good job. 
uh, even not having internal markets already established, maybe now established, but not really existing, you know, operating. Uh, uh, but still we have uh, some white stains to be filled, especially in terms of logistics of the uh, process of production uh, for the offshore wind and uh, with the issues dedicated to HE, HSEQ uh, of the production process, uh, the standards, certification as well, uh, and uh, for the smaller companies, I mean the uh, smaller, uh, the smallest players wanting to already just, just now enter the market or having very slight record on the market, uh, they need uh, a proven, established partner to establish partnership with uh, to have a good entry point. Uh, to uh, to the market because offshore wind uh, likes the proven track record in general uh, offshore wind clients I would say developers you know general contractors uh, turbine suppliers they all like companies with a proven track record but on the other hand uh, to deliver this what is to be delivered in offshore wind in Europe in the world uh, anyhow uh, we need to build new supply chains, new local supply chains, new resources, because otherwise this will not be happen. This th it will not happen. This capacity that is to be delivered. So uh, needs are on the uh, both sides, on the side of already existing good supply chains, well established supply chains, but on the side of uh, of the uh, emerging companies, emerging markets as well, to be uh, incorporated in the supply chains to strengthen the supply chains. To build new supply, supply chains locally to make the uh, scenarios happen. Thank you. Jose, uh, both Turana and, and Jakob are bringing up the issue of building local supply chains. How is your uh, perspective on that as an offshore wind developer? How is your sort of commitment to collaborate with the local uh, value chains? Okay. Can you hear me? No. Can you sure, hear me? Yeah, okay. So, um, I think it's a. Uh, I'm not. I don't have a silver bullet answer. <laughs> but and eventually, what I'm going to say is pretty much common sense. But the engaging suppliers and, and, and doing that work, it's it's a continuous work, and many companies have that capability. Therefore, and they attract easily suppliers with existing projects. <laughs> So that they know capabilities and then can think about new markets and bringing those actors with them, right? And this is a bit, a bit like we, what we do. Um, when we come to the reality of these countries that I have the pleasure to work, but they are tough because the regulation is not there, then what we are talking is that uh, it's a bit more, it's a much more difficult to convince actors to be with us when the market is not there yet. So it's a little bit the chicken and the egg situation. Um, at the same time, as, as already mentioned here several times, uh, we leave the awkward situation, and, and it, this is novel, this is novel for the industry, I believe, um, that in these countries where regulation is not there, but there are already targets, the, 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 we know that the administrations are, are, are working their way through the through the drafting of, of the of those of those rules of the game. We have this uh, above us this this big umbrella of of uh, of knowing that there are many challenges and shortages. So there is already this dialogue. So yeah, I mean the first thing is that the market exists that boosts communication throughout companies. And because what we leave is, is pretty much uh, uh, an ad hoc situation where companies have the ability to attract and dialogue with supply chain, others eventually less, and ma much work is done through associations uh, uh, like the one we presented here that consolidates a group of, of interests or, or, or the, the Norwegian one as well, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, those are driving forces that exist, but they are not a, a commodity yeah. <laughs> across the globe, right? Yeah, so, so an important message, uh, we need predictability that there will actually be a market uh, to be able to build these strong local supply chains. Uh, I will move on to you, Nevin, uh, back to the 
uh, topic of international collaboration. How do you see the potential for collaboration with your neighboring countries in the Adriatic Sea and who will be your most important partners in this uh, development? Uh, obviously, uh, Northern Adriatic Sea would uh, best be uh, developed together with uh, Italian partners uh, since they have a bigger market for electricity. And uh, also I would draw your attention to uh, the fact that uh, there is already uh, gas rigs there which were developed uh, jointly by uh, Italian and Croatian partners. Uh, so there is uh, already such a cooperation and these gas rigs will start to retire in uh, 25 um, and uh, the company that owns them is uh, already pondering uh, uh, using the concession to switch to offshore wind. Uh, but that also means that there is um, a local uh, uh, capacity, regional capacity for uh, uh, positioning and uh, piping and uh, uh, or, or cabling uh, because those gas rigs already have this connection so this uh, knowledge could be used also uh, for uh, wind uh, offshore. Thank you. So in the Baltic Sea, uh, uh, it holds an incredible potential for, for offshore wind uh, and is also enclosed by no less than eight countries, as we uh, discussed previously. So it could be a real example of international collaboration in offshore wind. And uh, you talked about the L-Wind project. Uh, I'm wondering what, you th what that says about, uh, about the future of offshore wind in the Baltic Sea and is it uh, transnational? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, definitely. The Baltic Sea holds huge potential and uh, Estonia's waters around Estonia uh, has huge potential as well. Uh, the Elvin projects uh, will be the between Estonia and Latvia will definitely be a pioneering project uh, which shows good example of transnational cooperation. Um, I, am, I am really sure that uh, this uh, transnational cooperation is the future, especially in Baltic Sea, because as you mentioned, there are eight countries and this, uh, the sea area is not so so huge that some countries in near the Atlantic, they have the same sea area, um, but we are sharing with, with uh, eight countries. So, so definitely uh, the transnational is the future. It, it takes more time, but in, in the end, it's more cost efficient. Uh, developing uh, creed uh, to, uh, um, when you are making transnational um, uh, cooperation it's it, it will be the backbone for for and for all of the countries and uh, everybody can win from it and uh, let's say uh, it's it's definitely the way to continue um, but yeah there are definitely challenges about the timeline but i'm i'm quite sure that uh, it will be the future uh, for uh, and it also helps actually uh, when you are making already transnational cooperation uh, we a lot of speakers spoke about supply chains and uh, local supply chains so so uh, and also was mentioned that no country can uh, most probably to pro provide all the necessary supply chains so so uh, the transnational cooperation is definitely good ground for giving potential for supply chains. Let's say there will be some supply chains uh, combined from Estonian ports, some from Latvian ports, maybe some from Poland, Finland. Everybody is giving their own share. Somebody is maybe producing uh, um, something, uh, the foundation, somebody is uh, uh, producing electronic components, somebody is providing technicians. So it's definitely uh, uh, transnational. Thank you. So, uh, speaking of uh, supply chains uh, and the infrastructure as well, uh, floating wind, uh, Panagiotis, is a game changer for offshore wind in the Mediterranean, uh, where the deeper waters make costs higher for bottom fixed installations than in the North Sea and the Baltics. Uh, so, as of today, I would say France is the, it's the leading country for floating wind in the Mediterranean with three pilot farms. Uh, to be installed in 2023 and also to 
uh, floating offshore wind tenders uh, for commercial projects coming uh, this year. Uh, and my experience from working in France is that this raises a lot of questions related to the development of local supply chains and infrastructure and adapted infrastructure and the development of, of ports uh, especially. Maybe how is the development of the required infrastructure coming along in Greece? Uh, and what are your uh, supply chain needs in meeting this development? Why is that? Because wind energy is being criticized in our countries that does not bring a real added value to the country. And we buy wind turbines, and you know, wind turbines in most of wind, for example, it's 80 percent or 75 percent of the whole capex of the project. And we bring, okay, can you listen? Yep. Yeah. So, uh, better, better, okay. So, uh, this is the main reason that all of us are struggling to have some local supply chain. I will agree with you. It's impossible that one country delivers all the supply chain. And not only it's impossible, it's wrong. Uh, it will not optimize the system. The optimization of the system is to find the local champions in every country and to see how these local champions can collaborate between them in regions and at the end in all the European Union, in the broader European Union, I include Norway as well, obviously, uh, in order to draw down the costs and to have a competitive industry versus the other continents. We have seen that, and there is also a discussion now with the war, that there is also a geop geopolitical parameter and risk also in the wind energy. It starts a discussion about raw materials and if all this becomes massive, how are we going to find the necessary materials in order to, to, to really exploit wind energy as we should exploit. So we have very carefully to collaborate, to try to be independent, to exploit the local samples in every country and at the end bring the result to the end customer which is cheap green electricity. One last comment. Uh, during the COVID years, in Greece and in the other European countries, there was the so-called Recovery and Resilience Fund. And the administration was calling us as an association. They were saying, do you need some money maybe to promote wind energy and for the wind energy projects, etc.? And where should we focus the money? Our answer was, wind energy is sufficient. We do not need grants. Where we need you to focus potential money, grants, that are available in the European sphere is to increase the capacity of our infrastructures, ports, uh, shipyards, all the, not the supply chain necessarily, but the necessary infrastructure, because it is stupid to install a floating wind turbine by manufacturing it in a shipyard or in a port in Norway. Norway has many other things to, to supply to us, but we have in order to optimize cost to increase our uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Do I have time for um, one or two more questions? Or uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, local content is uh, is important. So I will spend a little bit more time on that. I know you wanted to talk about it in your. Oh, you have a comment. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yes. I, th I think it's uh, when it comes to local content, it's important <coughs> to differ uh, between the installation phase or the capex, as it's called, and the operation phase. Um, I think uh, the local content is quite relevant for the operational phase. Uh, most uh, wind farm projects is running for 20 to 25 years. In that time, you can build a very strong supply chain on the operation and maintenance. When it's come down to the CAPEX installation, uh, it takes time to build the supply chain. For example, Norway, uh, we don't have a, a supply chain in floating offshore wind. We have one in floating oil and gas. 
And we think that most of those companies could go into floating offshore wind. But it takes time. It's different business models. It's different certification. Uh, it takes time to build that uh, capacity. And, and I think, uh, especially on local content, and if you see on the turbine manufacturers, uh, we don't have national champions when it comes to turbine manufacturers. There are two in Europe, right? And they are globally. They have like 95% of the global market because they are so specialized and they had the capacity to produce a lot of units. So I think it's important to, to differ between the operation phase and the installation phase when we talk yeah. about local content. Great, thank you. Uh, do you want to add something, Jacob? I know you wanted to take uh, this up in your presentation local, as well. Yeah. I can speak about local content all the time, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, one second, sorry, but uh, there are many remarks we might hear. Uh, this uh, distinguishing between OPEX and CAPEX in terms of local content is a really important thing, with what was mentioned here. But uh, thanks to my colleagues from Estonia and Greece, these topics, uh, this, this topics raised by them in these speeches uh, were really vital. There is no you know, supply chain uh, existing in, in the world, I would say, which is ready and able to deliver a whole value chain for the project. Offshore wind uh, already stopped to be a boutique sector, I would say. It's a regular, normal, large-scale industry. Uh, and what we need to make uh, supply chains and the, the schedules of the projects realized by the same developers, in many cases, you know, like Ersted or Debris and so on, in many places in, in the world, is to assure that the competences of the local supply chains are complex uh, thanks to uh, uh, thanks to collaboration, like for example, Poland is strong, very strong in steel constructions, in shipbuilding industry, in the cabling systems production. Uh, in the other countries, we have different, you know, uh, stronger sites. And uh, the question uh, is to how combine the supply chains internationally to make this mechanism working internationally as a grid, I would say, of the supply chains to deliver all the projects uh, to to once again to make these scenarios, uh, specific country scenarios for the offshore development happen. I think that is uh, a good note to, to end the discussion on. Uh, the need to find synergies actually between our country's uh, local supply chains. Um, and uh, I'll just say that uh, also one of the main messages I caught here today uh, is the urgent need for speed and capacity. Uh, it's been repeated many times. For Europe to reach its off offshore wind targets, we need enough people and resources as well as the right policies. Uh, this, as has been underlined, can only be achieved by international collaboration, uh, which has also yeah, been said by all of the speakers, and we have several concrete invitations here today for international collaboration. Uh, so uh, let's take this invitation seriously and start uh, the work. Uh, also, uh, just a short comment, keep in mind the opportunity to make use of the EEA and Norway grants programs for inter international business partnerships uh, as a concrete suggestion for how to make um, all these nice words about international collaboration into concrete action. Uh, so a warm thank you to all of today's speakers. It's been really interesting to learn about offshore wind in your countries. And I think it's been a good uh, discussion. Uh, it's good that we want to continue <laughs> the discussion. I have lots more to say, but I hope the discussion will continue through the lunch break. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you.